Hello and welcome to this Nature.com custom webcast titled Advancing Proteomics Research with the Tim's Toff Pro. My name is Jay Shan Carpen and I will be your moderator. Today's webcast is sponsored by Brooker. We'll begin the webcast with a presentation from Andrew Webb of the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute of Medical Research in Australia and then end with a Q&A session. To ask a question, just type it in where it says type your question here and then press submit at any point during the webcast and we will answer them today. And now over to Andrew. Hello and welcome. Um, so firstly, thank you to, to Nature Webcast and also to Brooker for giving me the opportunity to talk you through, through some of our experience, um, experiences with the new Tim's Top platform. Um, and what I'd like to do today is is to really walk you through some of the reasoning behind we're really starting to invest a, a lot of time and, and energy into exploring the platform and, and seeing what it can do. Um, particularly because we can see the sorts of, as you know, this we've seen this technology grow on the horizon, we can see the sorts of major applications it can have in, in medical research. So just to start off, um, to start off, what I'd like to sort of firstly explain, explain is so we're, we're really focused at my institute. So I, I exist, I, my laboratory exists here at the Walter Eliza Hall Institute. We're a, an old medical research institute. Um, and I would say one of the, the, the leading re medical research institutes within Australia. Um, I run the, the Proteome Platform Technology Laboratory here as a, as a collaborative platform lab. Um, as an institute, we really focus quite broadly on, on cancer, immune disorders, infectious disease. And now more recently, uh, we're quite focused on aging and development as well. So. In terms of the spectrum of disease, we cover a very wide um, array of, of different projects. The, our institute has 93 laboratories with more than 1,000 staff now. And this means that through our laboratory, we have to be reasonably high throughput. So I think, you know, certainly in terms of thinking about that throughput and stability of the platform, this has been very important for us to consider when we think about our infrastructure. And one of the things that's really grown um, over the, and evolved over the time with my laboratory is this this idea that we need to be detecting proteoforms. You know, this is identifying you know the types of forms of proteins that exist when you take into account um, post-translation modification and other post-translational effects. And this is something I'll talk a little bit about. And obviously, you know, we're obviously very uh, interested in in deeper discovery. We're always interested in in looking at the next technology. You know, what it is that can give us a, a more sensitive, deeper read of the the proteomes that we're looking at as we think these directly um, lead to, to better insights into to the sorts of diseases that we're looking at. So this really sort of brings me to, you know, we, we, we as I mentioned, we're, we're really interested in this deeper discovery for better insights and, and how uh, can we really better detect these protein forms. And this is something, as I mentioned, that we've really been focused on, not just from a from a software, but also from a hardware point of view. And this, this idea, and I've got a, a picture of an iceberg here, and I think mass spectrometers are incredibly sensitive, but the dynamic range that exists within, within, um, you know, within cells and, and within lots of biofluids that we analyze is much larger. So we're really, with, with current, even current mass spectrometers, we're really just getting the tip of the iceberg. And I think it's, it's how we really dissect out these proteomes that is, is obviously really important um, as well. So proteoforms, just a little bit about why, um, what proteoforms are and, and why we think they're important. Um, so in bottom proteomics, we, we really, we majority of labs around that I think that are doing proteomics, um, I, I think of these as, as reasonably gene centric. Um, you know, we're, we're mapping peptides back to, to some sort of single accession number or, or, or gene level, um, <clears throat> gene level point of information. But we know that most of, a lot of the things that we identify um, are actually modified in some way post-translationally. And you, we, when you think about, you know, where life really exists, you know, whilst we can detect, you know, around you know, 11 to 13,000 genes that are expressed in any cell type at any given point in time, we expect that through the types of post-translational modifications, this could be through RNA editing, it could be through coding for, for different SNPs, um, it's could be through transcriptional regulation, where there are truncations and these sorts of things, or even post-translation modifications, where you get you know, cleavage through proteases, or you have phosphorylation, or other types of modif 
classification. We, we know now, of course, that you know, there are more than 107 identified endogenous post-translation modifications. So the combinatorial complexity of what can exist in, in these protein samples is, is potentially astronomical. And people you know, throw values around, but you know, I anticipate that this is probably in the, in, the, in the region of about 10 million proteoforms for a given cell at any point in time. So it's, I think it's our goal in, in my laboratory to really try and dig as deep and, and focus on um, as many of these proteoforms as possible. And if we can make measurements at these proteoform levels, I believe these are the sort of the direct correlators and direct predictors of, of phenotype. This is as close as it gets to, to really being able to understand why we see differences in, in phenotypes. So I think one of the best approaches for really looking at these proteoforms and the different forms of proteins that it can exist is when we analyze proteins intact. And this is something that we worked on a few years ago and we've just recently submitted this for, for publication. But we worked on a, a way to clean up proteins in a very high throughput and um, efficient way. And we use these through, through um, a magnetic bead. So we, we use this as a, as a nucleation reagent to precipitate our proteins on. This is, if you're familiar with SP, the S, recent SP3 approach, this is a, a take on that. But then what we, we did is we combined this with um, an additional elution. So this is an elution step where we took um, we, we took um, some knowledge from the protein aggregation field where they use formic, cold formic acid to actually loop proteins in a very efficient way. And when you do this, um, we ended up with a very robust way, a highly re reproducible way of, of releasing intact proteins. So this here is just the MS1 signal. So this is just measuring all the intact proteins that we can detect in a single shotgun. We, on average, we were detecting about 2,000 different forms of proteins that exist. And we could see an incredible array of heterogeneity here. And the reason I wanted to show this is that when we looked at this, on average, each of the proteins that we see exists in probably on average in about eight different forms. So just from looking at sort of this very, you know, top of the iceberg type of snapshot of the proteins that exist in from a cell line, that we can see that there's an enormous heterogeneity within the forms of proteins that exist here. If there were ways to dig deeper into this, we think this would be absolutely fantastic. Um, I think this is really just the top of the iceberg though, because I think when you think about analyzing intact proteins, the signals are very distributed through isotopes and also through the charge form. So it means that our, our dynamic range is, is quite um, compressed. So we, we have a, a distinct lack of being able to dig very deep into the proteome. So the question for us was really, how could we dig much deeper into proteoforms um, we, and to truly, you know, to dig as, as, as far as we can to try and find better signatures um, for, for the disease states of interest. And I think traditional proteomics, you know, when you think about, you know, mapping peptides, and I'll show a slide in a minute that articulates this a bit better, but when we think about mapping peptides back to proteins, I think we pretend to, we tend to lose a lot of this information um, through this process. So what we try to do at every point now with most of our projects that we work on is maintain um, the peptide, even to the point of doing peptide level statistics between, you know, the different questions that we're asking in a, in a relative quantitative fashion. Obviously, when we um, when we do this, it, the instrumentation becomes very important. Um, there's one point I'd like to make here, where I think probably these are something that we've worked on the most over the last, you know, sort of four or five years, um, is the, I think the real, the real, the, the key challenges are really in the experimental design. So it's getting the controls right with the sample. It's getting enough replicates there. I think that the next important thing is is really thinking very carefully about the type of proteome you want to enrich. I mean, if you imagine that you know every, any proteome is is really an iceberg floating in water, and you only have the the option of of getting the the, the, the top of the iceberg, then thinking very carefully about what, where your signatures and where your biological information is likely to lie is, is probably one of the next um, most important things. And this, this, this is the same for, for PTM enrichment. I, I class this in the same category of, of enrichment, but you can do this obviously at the protein level or at the peptide level as well, which is quite often done for phosphopeptides and other modifications. What I'm showing here is just an overview of a standard discovery proteomics workflow, and I assume most of you are quite familiar with this process of taking proteins digesting them with something like an enzyme like trypsin to break them into smaller peptides. Um, doing a, a UHPLC step, 
acquiring the data on a mass spec over time through gradient dilution, and then analysing sort of intact peptide ions and, and looking at um, MS2 information to it, in which we search through uh, probability of a space to three search engines to identify these spectra with a, a false discovered rate cutoff. And this is, we don't do anything different in, in, in terms of this. In terms of how we apply this, I think um, proteomics can be, it's, it's really left to your creativity with, with the experimental design. There's so many different areas that we can apply this. And this is for me, one of the, the most, you know, fundamentally exciting areas of, of why, you know, where mass spectrometry can help in, in medical research. We certainly have a, a lot of different uh, interests around you know, drug targets and mechanisms of action around protein complexes and structural information. Um, protein dynamics, we're doing a lot of hydrogen tumor exchange, also interact dynamics and fossil proteomics as well as cell surface, and more recently looking uh, toward and into the future with, with a lot more clinical biomarker work. And this is something I think is of um, what that has piqued our particular interest with the Timstoff Pro is the stability, the long-term stability of the signal that we have on this instrument is is unparalleled. We haven't seen this on, on any other instrument where we can potentially run the instrument for um, you know, six, 12 months, if not beyond that, without anything more than a capillary chain on, on this instrument. And I, I truly believe that this is probably one of the most um, fundamental um, advances that is going to make a significant impact in the, the clinical biomarker space. So I mentioned this earlier before that I, I this is my belief. Um, I think proteomics is predominantly a little bit too gene centric. And this is the idea that you know, we digest proteins into peptides and we identify spectra, that when we work backwards from here, <clears throat> what we're really mapping to is genes and not peptides. And this is my explanation as to why we should be really focusing on, on peptides. Um, I think it's the potential to lose information going through this step is, is particularly quite important um, for, for so many of the projects that we work on. And we need to be much more proteform centric. So the most important thing I think out of this sort of the, the practical implications of this thinking is that peptide level quantification is, is, can be quite challenging and I think this is where the decision around the type of inf instrument that you use and the infrastructure that you put around it becomes very important. And something that we noticed um, a number of years ago, going back to 2013, um, we looked at the IMPACT2 um, instrument that came from Brooker and we found it to be um, incredibly fast um, and very, very sensitive. We, we, the, the type of iron, the, the iron transmission that we saw was incredibly efficient. We saw incredible signals of this instrument um, that we were impressed with compared to our other platforms that we were using at the time. And the other thing with this instrument was it itself is, was incredibly, ro incredibly robust as well. So we could, we could be doing injections of, of plasma for weeks on end um, with appropriate sample preparation, but, but not seeing any degradation of the signal. And this is, this is what's led to this instrument, the IMPACT-2 in our laboratory being sort of a, the go-to instrument for, for anything where we require this longitudinal um, acquisition of data. Also, the other area that we worked on uh, was the chromatography. So I spent a long time in my laboratory looking at developing the nanochromatography um, that I'll talk a little bit about later on um, that has led to sort of this robust acquisition at the, the nanoflow level as well. But I just wanted to quickly walk you through some of the, the things that we noticed on the impact too early on that were quite surprising to us. And this was just really looking down in the, the low level um, quantitative ability of the instrument. This is where you can sort of look down into the grass at the, the low signal level and see this quite robust signal. So here I'm just showing compared to the red versus the blue is just the intensity profile of replicates on two different instrument platforms, the red being a, an alternative vendor, um, the blue being the impact. Um, and you can see when you look down at the log two fold change with the log two p value change, that actually the, the in black here is um, the impact two values were much tighter. We've got to zoom in on the next slide where you can zoom down and we've actually plotted the the fold increase of of the the numbers of things that exist in the, the lower C V region. So you can see here that we're down the very low region, we're seeing, you know, upwards of a hundred, two hundred fold increase in numbers of things that we can reliably identify in very low CV values. So this is something that became quite, um, you know, we became uh, a big key decision in terms of the infrastructure that we were working with um, in these instances. So 
One of the things that surprised us when we started working with impact was obviously we had better quantitation. We have a big tick there. But one thing that we noticed was that the increased speed and sensitivity of this instrument didn't translate to more identifications. And this is something that, that confounded us a little bit. <clears throat> um, so you can see here in, in blue and, and red, I've got, this is just the, uh, the numbers of, to represent the numbers of features that we identify within a given run. So we noticed that in comparing our Q Exactive platform with our Impact 2, we found that we would identify a lot more features. Even if we ran here, I'm showing we're running a shorter gradient, you can see a slight increase in the, the intra-scan dynamic range by the number of spots so on the vertical axis is the intensity of the feature that we found versus the retention time. So you can see the, the width of the, or the height of the, the blue dots representing what the features we found within the Impact 2. You can see that we found a lot more features, but this didn't necessarily translate um, to more identifications. And we think what was happening is that because this instrument is so sensitive, what we're actually doing is seeing many more precursors co-eluting. So if you can imagine that you have a lot of co-eluting species, and if you have more sensitivity, you can see more things that are coming through. And the further you dig down, the more features you see. So there's this sort of this exponential increase of, of features at the, at the lower level. So the more sensitive you are, the more complex it gets within the sample. And this was, when we looked at the data, this was exactly what we found. If you look at this graph that's right over on the, up, on the right side, this is where we took um, the isolation window for the fragmentation. And looking within that isolation window, we can see the number of, we just did a count of the number of co precursors, the co peptide species that we saw there. And on average, we can see here that on average, with every peptide isolation, we can actually see four precursors that are co within that isolation space. So within a near isobaric range, we're co-isolating, co-fragmenting. And what this was generating was, was uh, a significant amount of chimeric spectra. And we found this to be a, a really a limiting factor in, in, identifying, in um, identifying these peptides. Obviously, you're generating spectra that is now made up of um, four or more um, peptides that are being fragmented together and search engines don't typically work well um, with with these uh, sorts of um, complexities. So another fundamental limitation that we've we've noticed and, and sort of become quite familiar with over, over the last few years is sort of the fundamental hardware limitations and this is you know this has been a function of just how how we've had to run mass spectrometers to acquire data so most labs will, will generate, you know, either operate in either of these in a data dependent acquisition fashion, fashion or a data independent acquisition fashion. There's a lot of labs that obviously bridge this gap as well. But with all the current approaches on current instrumentation, not using iron mobility, which I'll talk about later on, there's the instruments can only really be used in, in a way that, that really doesn't take advantage of the full iron beam that's coming into the instrument. If you think of it as a, a stream of ions coming in, all of these techniques that exist in data dependent, data independent acquisition use a, a fraction of the incoming iron beam. And I see this as a, as a significant inefficiency. With trapping instruments, this is up here, I have trapping instruments for ST, but on a 60K, 60,000 resolution read on an Orbi trap, the, the fill time on this generally for a high, high uh, concentration signal beam for a nanoflow, you're only trapping about a millisecond of ions into the trap to get these reads. Um, Likewise, on QTOS, you generally, every time you're doing an isolation event, um, you are excluding all of the rest of the ion beam. So most of the time you're spending accumulating fragment spectra. So you're actually most of your ions are again going away to, to gas, to, to the vacuum. And also with the DIA approaches, um, you're using a slightly wider, using a, a slightly wider part of the ion beam with the quadrupole. You know, you're looking between four and 25 Thompsons but you're still only using a, a small fraction, you know, up to, you know, four or 5% of the actual iron beam that's coming in at any one time. So that's an enormous amount of potential information that you're, you're throwing away to the vacuum and, and not using at all. And I, 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 I found this picture that sort of describes this process that you're really sort of snapping at the iron beam a lot of the time and, and missing a lot of the ions that, that, that actually come through. Um, the other, one of the other things with, I, I believe there's a, a limitation on with data independent, current data independent acquisition strategies is this relatively slow cycle times. That, that um, necessity to scan through the entire beam um, 
it takes quite a long time for the instrument to actually acquire that data. So your, your cycle times to get back to that same isolation window to get your next set of data can be anywhere from two to four seconds. And generally it's, it's closer to four seconds with most um, data independent acquisition strategies. And I have to disclose that I'm a co-founder in this company here um, in Iron Optics, but with a lot of sort of the latest um, chromatography that's available for nanoflow chromatography, the peak widths are well within these sort of four second cycle times. So you, you can have peaks that can almost come and go before you've had a chance to detect them. And this is something that's um, particularly quite apparent when you're starting to think about shorter gradients, which I think there is a bit of a trend in the field that people are thinking about, you know, getting depth of coverage by fractionating samples, but then doing um, more shorter gradients. And this is something that we're, we're certainly work, working um, towards as well. Um, there was an argument that was made a couple of years ago by um, Joshua Kuhn and Co that um, now more than ever proteomics needs better chromatography. But as I've described before, I think um, that I, I do believe we've probably reached this diminishing re returns from new instruments. I think more sensitivity, um, so being able to see more dynamic range and see more features in combination with better chromatography, so getting more peaks, I think this really translates to more chimeric spectra. And I, I don't see, with current instruments, I don't really see any way around this. I think this is, um, you know, we have looked at this in different ways in terms of trying to tease out identifications from chimeric spectra, but as soon as you're starting adding, you know, multiples of peptides and co-fragmenting them, they do become quite difficult and challenging. And I think this is the case, this will be the case. It'll be quite a, a strong confounder for data independent acquisition as, as well. So how can we get around this? Um, I think iron mobility, so it's adding an orthogonal step of, of separation to increase the effective resolution of the instrument, I think is um, a very, uh, has a very high potential to, to help us really mitigate this and dig deeper into, into proteomes. So why isn't IMS available on, on every mass spectrometer, iron mobility, and I'll talk a little bit about what, I'm, what IMS is and, and how, it, how it works um, in a minute. Um, and I think this is really comes down to traditionally the, the complexity, um, the iron losses um, through that process, and also the inherent low duty cycle when you put a, an IMS, uh, an IMS um, device on the front of a mass spectrometer. And I think some, for me, the really exciting thing is, is what Brooker has developed over a number of years um, is a device that can sit on the front of an instrument um, that has incredibly stable electronics. I think it, it really simplifies this, this complexity issue, particularly within the size, um, given that it's, it has a, a trapping function there. Um, I think the iron losses, while they, they still do occur, they're going to occur in, in any IMS um, where you're um, trapping and, and exposing them to a gas flow. Um, that what you get in this this new device, this TIMS analyzer, is a dramatic sensitive gain, sensitivity gain, and this is something I'll explain a little about why we get this. Um, the other advantage of this is that it has the potential. So we don't switch off um, really any of the iron beam. It's it's near. I call. I say it won't be completely, but it's it's near 100% duty cycle. So really, you know, this idea of you know filling the glass with uh, with all the ions that are incoming. Um, I think this has enormous potential that we're not losing any of that iron beam. We're sampling as much of it as we possibly can, and that means um, potentially a lot more information. So this is a slide that I took from Gary, who's um, obviously I've, I've known for a number of years now at Brooker. Um, the right way to do IMS dual TIMS. Um, so this is ba the basic layout of the TIMS device. Um, I don't have a pointer, but I can I can try and walk you through it as best I can. There's actually two regions within the analyzer itself. You have this accumulation region, um, and then the next bit is, is where you have the, the ramping region in the analyzer two. So the incoming ions will filter into this first region where they'll accumulate, and there will be a, a bit of separation there. And then sequentially, they will let these ions through into the analyzer section when they can be stepped out um, of this in timing with, with the, the top pusher. So actually, the Every scan line is, is, is a tough push now. So this ability to have a dual trapping function and letting ions through means that we don't have to switch off the iron beam at any point in time. We can just sequentially keep accumulating and separating, accumulating and separating. And this is what really allows us 
um, for the first time to really take advantage um, of this trapping function on the front of the TOF and allow you to have um, nearly 100% duty cycle. So as I mentioned before, you know, we were quite excited when we heard that, that Brooker was putting this on the front of their TOF platform. So the, obviously I mentioned before about the impact and the stability and the sensitivity and the efficiency of iron transmission with this impact, the, with this QTOF. We thought that this was actually going to be an amazing combination. And I think this is this is something that for me is is still, I mean, we've had our, our instrument for over a year now and we're still really excited about the potential of, of this instrument as it, as the the software develops and, and, and matures. So what I'd like to do is, is just talk about sort of one of the things that I found quite difficult and challenging was getting my head around what this new data looks like. So what happens when you put a, a TIM cell in front of a QTOF? Um, what does it actually look like? So this represents, you know, what the, the data that we usually accumulate on any, you know, normal mass spectrometer. It could be an orbit trap or a QTOF or FT. Um, that you get intensity values of, of MZ and you measure these over time. So this is where we get our chromatographic peaks. This is where we derive our intensity. You know, we get the area under the curve of the ions and, and this is generally what we use for our relative quantitation experiments. For the Tim's TOF, if you can imagine on a TOF, um, the every, every the intensity here is, is summed over time. So you have, in as the TOF is reading the ion beam, you've got these sequential, very fast reads. It's around 10 kilohertz on the impact, where you're summing data very quickly as the, as the TOF is scanning and reading and summating this over time. If you can imagine that instead of summating that data in time to give you really intense peaks, you actually had an ability to distribute this um, through a separate orthogonal way of, of separating these ions um, through ion mobility. So now imagine that you can flip this on its side and you can actually see the CCS values or the, the cross-sectional area of these, these um, ions as, you, as you're detecting them. So each scan here represents a single TOF push um, and a TOF read. And what you get is a raster through um, the mobility of the ions that are incoming. And you can see quite clearly here, the advantages of this is that you really start separating out your singly charged, your doubly charged, and your triply charged. And even within um, the doubly charged peptides, you can see that you're getting really, we, you can't see if you and I won't zoom in, but you can trust me that you, it has enough resolution here that you start separating out co-isobaric peptides, the peptides that have the identical same mass, but you, can, you start generally seeing a lot of these double peak masses. And these are things that can be differentially peak detected and, and used for, for quantitation. So just to visualize this in a slightly different way, um, as I mentioned, we normal mass spec data, we take these reads in time. Um, these are generally done at, you know, on air impact, we run these at four hertz. So it, this works equates to 222,200 TOF scans for, for each summation. Now we use the same detector, but we do it in a different way. So we have these frames and we, we measure these frames um, and we can, just within the instrument parameters, we can set the frame rate. So we can set how many scan lines we want and what sort of uh, resolution that we want in the separation of the TIMS as well. With some, um, well, actually we don't, <laughs> we don't uh, adjust the resolution, but you do see slight resolution differences between you on the frame rate. But most of the, the, the frame rate that we're working on is, is around, um, around 10 Hertz. So, I think one of the, the really amazing insights came, and this was uh, through collaboration with Matthias Mann's lab um, uh, a few years ago now with Brooker, where they came up with this idea of, of this, this sequential um, MSMS. And this, again, uses this near 100% utilization of, of the TIM. So you can see here we've got, this is, I've represented this instead of scan lines, this is the mobility, this is the same, essentially the same, you're just giving it a, a mobility value here on the y-axis with the MZ on the, on the bottom axis. And simply what passive is, is that it has the ability to, to feature detect on the fly the features that are present in the mobility plane. And in the next sequential um, frames that it's, it's taking, it applies and um, it does very fast switching on the quad to isolate these things. And it will isolate these things sequentially through the, the drift time. So you can see here these red circles, they'll each sequentially be isolated and given a, a you know, 
you know, uh, maybe a dozen or so um, scans to, to actually fragment. So what you end up with is um, this pattern of, of MSMS peaks that uh, have a co-mobility. They share this, they're encoded with their cross-sectional area. So you remember with the setup of the instrument that your mobility is, is first, you then pass through the quad and then the collision cell before it hits the TOF detector. And so this is the reason that the, the mobility happens first. You separate the mobility on the incoming ions and then do the fragmentation after. And this is why the fragment ions encode the same mobility. They exist in the same plane as the, the cross-sectional area um, of the precursor. And this is, this is how we match through. We take from the MS1 side, we match through the mobility and isolate these MSMS. So this gives, gives um, the instrument an ability to, within a single scan, to isolate many, many MSMS events. And cumulatively, as you're running this, if you're doing you know, uh, 10 frames of MSMS to one frame MS1, it means that you can potentially run this at about up to 100, but anywhere between 100 and 160 hertz. So there's an enormous amount of sampling that you can do um, in the MSMS space. Yeah, that's sort of. Um, and this leads to some pretty um, um, pretty reasonable results. We've been um, really happy with the numbers of identifications that we're getting. This is some of the data that was provided from Brooker. It's a little old now. There's some, some newer data. But basically on um, a relatively small amount of input, so from 200 nanograms now, um, this is from, a, from just healer cell culture, the sorts of numbers you can get for a single injection um, are pretty high. So more than 5,000 proteins consistently. And the, the numbers of, of um, proteins identified between the replicates are pretty consistent. And also the, the quantitation that exists um, is also very accurate as well at, at the protein level. Um, from our instrument, we're, we're seeing um, very similar numbers, if not a little bit um, improved, as we've improved the, the chromatography a little bit. Um, here I'm just showing on the left, um, we're trialling some new columns at the moment with different gradient lengths. And you can see that these are the protein counts. You can see even dropping to, to shorter column lengths that we still have a, a pretty significant depth of coverage with, with proteins. And if we back this up or we do an experiment design where we're using a pre-fractionation, you can imagine the sort of throughput and depth of coverage we can we can obtain um, by combining you know this fractionation with very short gradients and this is something that we think we can we'll get as much closer to um, if we turn it full proteome coverage this is where we can you know have a quantitative measure of, of, of most of the proteins that are being expressed not necessarily all the proteoforms that exist the other thing we've been incredibly surprised by is the sensitivity of this instrument so this is in the middle graph here I've just shown the the loading that we've applied, um, so everywhere from, from 40 nanograms up to 200 nanograms. Um, you can see that our, interestingly, our um, protein number doesn't drop off as much. Um, obviously, that the peptide numbers drop off, as you would expect going down and load. But we've been pretty impressed with the number of identifications that we're getting, even at these very low yields. And I think this, this for us really is, is very key. You know, a lot of the samples that we're generating, particularly if you're looking at any sort of enrichment on you know, things like phosphopeptides, um, particularly around phosphotyrosine, if you're doing any sort of protein-protein um, interactions where you're looking at very low abundance proteins, this sort of sensitivity is going to be incredibly important for us in, in identifying um, a lot of the biological signatures and measurements that we need to. Um, the other thing that we're very interested in doing is, is applying um, the instrument and the Timstoff Pro to, to phosphopeptides. And here I've got some, some data from Heiner Koch at, at Brooker. Um, so he's done a, a short gradient and a medium gradient and seeing some pretty impressive numbers. And in our hands, we see very similar sorts of things. Um, this is some older data now. We have some, um, some newer data that, that's suggesting we can improve this even more with some, some tweaks to our workflow. But we're sort of seeing in the order of, so for me, you know, 250 micrograms of input, it's getting us down to the region of being able to do um, direct ex vivo work. We can look at primary tissues and primary cell populations, and we can start analyzing pretty meaningful numbers of phosphopeptides here. Um, and actually quite impressively with the sorts of, um, if, for those of you that are familiar, um, the quality of this spectra to give the site localization has been, um, we've been quite impressed by this as well. So 
Um, moving on to sort of the future applications that we see, um, and this is certainly starting to come out with, with other groups as well that are working on similar things, is, is really sort of taking advantage of this, this ability to um, maximise this incoming ion beam and utilise this orthogonal separation, so where we can, with, with mobility and, and having an ability to be able to fragment things and, and locate where their, their, um, their fragment ions exist. So one of the things we trialled early on was whether we could, um, on the left here I've got the, sorry, on the right here I've got the um, MS1, so these are all the incoming ions, and we wanted to see if we could just fragment everything and see what we could match out of this process. Um, and the real advantage to doing this is that in every single MS2 frame, which I'll show you in a minute, in, in every MS2 frame you're accumulating um, more signal for your, your fragmented ions, so it's potentially a much more sensitive way of extracting um, more MS2 information, which really is probably one of the fundamental limitations with identifying anything, is, is having enough intensity within your MS2 spectra. So we saw this as a way of potentially digging deeper by identifying deeper into, into proteomes. Um, obviously, you know, we all, we all think that, you know, sometimes we're smart and they actually are, that when I, when I looked through the, the existing literature, I found that this idea of using this, this idea of using all line fragmentation to accumulate signal. This was, this was done, um, you know, near 19 years ago, and this idea of, of using this co-mobility to, to co-locate these things with, within David Clemens group. So it's always quite humbling, and um, I'm always a, a avid reader of, of the old literature. Um, and yeah, I don't ever want to be uh, uh, accused of, of reinventing the wheel, but in this case, I think we did. So just to explain this a little bit more clearly, um, what we're really trying to achieve here is, you know, obviously take out a, if we've identified or found a precursor of iron of interest, we want to go and extract the region of MS2 to see if we could we can associate the MS2 fragments here. And in this in this region, um, one of the things we're really impressed with when we started looking at all this data was actually the fidelity and the, the, the richness of the data that we see in this MS2 framework. There's an enormous amount of ions that we see here when you start fragmenting everything that's coming into, into the instrument. But really the idea was to um, basically use the mobility of the fragment ions. And I think this is something that's relatively unique in this field, um, where we were using the mobility of the ions um, to actually isolate them out. So this really gives you an amazing amount of um, um, signal to noise because you're really you're taking the ions that only match your precursor and not taking overlapping ions. You're not just drawing a bounding box around the whole region and associating that region with your precursor of interest. You're really um, giving a, a very finite specificity to your precursor. So just to walk you through what we're actually doing in our workflow, if we take our region of the MS1, so this is the incoming ion, this is here you can see on the x-axis is the mobility, so this is the we're looking at the scans of the TOF as it's separating through um, mobility, and we can see the intensity here. If we take the corresponding region in the MS2, we can see that it's it's actually very complex. There's an enormous amount going on here. Um, but if we simply provide a, a simple correlation step where we just take the fragments that correlate in their peaks, we can really hone down to the peaks that are just matching to the precursor. And what we were quite excited by was the intensity of the ions that we can see coming through using this process because, as I mentioned, we're sequentially um, accumulating the same MS2 again and again and again. It means we're not losing um, any, any information by isolating any other region. And just to explain why we think this is, this is potentially quite important as, as this develops and, and probably more likely from other groups than ours, we, um, we, we probably don't have a, a, a big enough uh, group to be <laughs> super competitive in this space, but we're incredibly so excited to be um, at least partly involved. Um, is that particularly this really allows us to take advantage of the, the very fast chromatography we have as well. Um, so this um, this example is where I've had, so this is with the, I've switched the TIMS off and done a normal DDA run. So this is like the impact data that, as I mentioned before, we generated. You know, MS in time with intensity, um, and just for argument's sake, I, I went in and found the lowest intensity feature that we identified. Um, so here you can see I've done an extracted ion chromatogram at um, an MZ of, of 
And you can see here that I've got a nice peak shape in, in orange, the thin orange line. And what was used to actually identify this peak was actually this, this very little, I've drawn this width to represent the amount of time that the mass spec used um, to acquire the MS2 for this peak. So in this instance, it actually picked right on the apex of the peak, luckily, which I think led to its identification. But that width, that's all the time that the instrument actually spent in fragmenting this iron for us to, to detect it. So if we look at how what this looks like, um, and indeed we, we had a reasonable spectra that we're able to identify. So if we think about how this works with um, the DIA approach and the all iron approach on the Tim Stuff Pro, is that because we can identify this precursor, instead of just taking this very small narrow window of information, we can, through the fixed detection, we can actually associate all the ions that match this feature for the entire elution profile of, of this peak. And what this translates to, um, so this is the, on the left you can see the, the spectra for the, the TIMS off mode, and on the right you can see it with the TIMS on with the all line approach. And you can see relatively, you're seeing about the same sort of spectra. We see um, the same sorts of ions, maybe a few more ions in the all line. The thing that really blew us away was that when you compare the signal intensity of, of these two spectra, um, you're seeing anywhere from, a, a, on average, we're seeing about a 30 to 50 fold increase in sensitivity um, while maintaining very good mass accuracy on the fragment ions. So for me, this really represents, you know, this is, uh, an amazing potential to be accumulating an enormous amount of, of intensity of these fragment ions, which means that we can potentially you know, dig deeper into the proteome by, by being able to generate spectra from, from lower abundance precursors. That means we can identify things much, much lower um, in, in the intensity profile. So just quickly, um, we looked at you know, using a dynamic range standard, this is the UPS2, where we have 48 proteins across six sort of dynamic range. Here, I've just got the size um, of the fragment ion intensity shown here in these dots. So you can see with the all line approach that we can identify much deeper down into the very low regions of, of this dynamic range standard. Um, and the other thing that, that we've been um, not necessarily surprised by, because we, we, we've, you know, we've had the, the technology and the impact for, for a long time now, um, and given that they're using the same sorts of um, instrument at the back end, the, the, obviously the, the confidence in the mass accuracy is very high from, from this end. So we've been very impressed um, with this. So just to summarize, um, obviously I think, you know, it's obviously incredibly important to, to look at peptides. And I think this is something that we're gonna continue working on into the future. Um, probably for me, the take home message is that speed and sensitivity um, I don't think developing faster, more sensitive instruments is necessarily going to give us more useful information. I think we really have reached this point of diminishing returns. I do think that the, the Tim Stoff Pro giving us this extra dimension um, does represent a bit of a milestone in, in, in enabling us to sort of surpass this and get into to, you know, really rich data sets. Um, and this is something that we're incredibly excited to be working um, here in our laboratory and, and also a little bit with, with in partnership with Brooker through um, a couple of collaborations. Um, and I think the one thing that's, that we've been really impressed by is the stability of the CCS failures as well. And I think this is going to become, um, certainly with our approaches moving forward, this is something that's very important for us, this, this ability to be able to rely on these cross-sectional area values for the measurements we're making are going to be really important for extending this idea of accurate mass tagging. So this is you know, what I'm terming here, 3D accurate tagging. So I think um, this, uh, for me, this is, this is really crucial. I think this is going to be an amazing opportunity to develop some, um, some tools and software that can really uh, allow us to dig deep in proteomes, but accurately measure the, sat, the, the features and the peptides that we need to measure um, you know, across very large sample cohorts. So that, that just leads me to my acknowledged, um, uh, acknowledgements. I'd like to firstly acknowledge um, my laboratory. Um, so Giuseppe, uh, Daryl, uh, Jared and Rune have contributed to data for this, this presentation. Um, also for Brooker's support, in particular Lucy, Marcus for helping generate a lot of the early data that we're working with, um, Oliver for the ongoing um, collaboration work, and the rest of the team at Brooker that have been a, a, a great 
Um, they've been a great company to work with and, and we're really excited with um, the Tim stuff platforms that we have in place now. So we're, we're really looking forward to seeing what we can generate going to the future. So thank you for your attention. Um, yeah, look forward to taking any questions you might have. Thank you for your presentation, Andrew. It is now time for the Q&A. To ask Andrew a question, just type it in where it says type your question here and then press submit. So our first question, uh, and this one asks, um, given the improvements in signal to noise of this instrument, uh, do you think this has application in translating this technology into the clinic? Yes, um, thank you, Jay Shan. Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think this is probably one of the, the biggest things for us moving forward. We'll be applying this to much larger cohorts. I mean, we really want to take advantage of the stability of this instrument over long periods of time to start, you know, really start thinking about acquiring much larger data sets. Excellent. Thanks, Andrew. And our next question asks, um, how can um, how can accurate CCS values also help in this endeavor? Yeah, so I think this is, for me, this is really sort of extending the ideas developed at the Penn and L by Dick Smith and a lot of the people in his group over a large number of years, where you, they sort of really um, led this idea of accurate mass tagging, um, you know, by, by using the precursor itself as the, as the matching feature to being, you know, and identifying this across runs. And this is something that, you know, we are working on and we're working on algorithms and software for our, uh, in our laboratory. And we we believe that having an accurate CCS value is, is going to be enormously helpful when you have a, a stability value, you know, a, a value that is, is quite stable over time, that this will allow us to sort of really increase the accuracy of, of what we can match run to run. So we think this is actually going to be quite important in thinking about our um, important for our, our clinical applications. Excellent. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so our next question um, is uh, kind of asks uh, for a little bit more clarification um, in regards to um, the DIA window um, and in relation to the iron uh, mobility. Um, I was wondering... Yes. Perhaps if, if you can sort of clarify um, sort of point that you sort of made in your presentation there. Yeah, so I'm just I'm reading the question. Yeah. I'm not quite if I, I'll try and I'll try and um, I'll answer it as best as I understand it. Um, the question is sort of asking sort of a typical typical DIA window lasts for about 100 milliseconds. So that's accumulating you know 100 milliseconds of incoming iron beam to get to get the, the fragmentations from that region. Um, but with iron mobility, a peptide's typical evolution only lasts for about five milliseconds. Um, so you're looking about one twentieth of the linear dynamic range of some of the possibility. That that would be true if the iron mobility wasn't was just reading um, a sample of the beam. So it, with the TIMS, what actually happens is because you're accumulating, we we, we do a hundred hundred millisecond fill times, but because you're getting within the TIMS itself, you're getting an accumulation. Um, and separation at the same time. So that 100 millisecond worth of all the ions that are filling there are actually concentrating to within their, their region within the TIM cell. So when you're reading out, you actually you actually get about an 80 fold increase in the sensitivity of the ion that's there. So you're not, um, you're not typically losing too many ions, you're, you're sort of really concentrating, you know, from 100 milliseconds worth of ion beam, you're taking your ion out, accumulating it, and then getting a, a more sensitive read on it. So for me, for me, you, I mean, you do you do lose some sensitivity, um, overall sensitivity, but what you gain in in signal to noise is is far greater. So I think you know while the, there is a bit of a drop in signal running it through the tims, what we get back in in signal to noise is is far superior. Excellent. Thanks, Andrew. Um, and our next question um, also asks for a, a little bit sort of more clarification and hopefully you you can answer it um, but this one's wondering if the um, whether the water draining effect um, relates to the collisional cross-sectional values um, in your workflow is that something 
can perhaps answer? Yeah, look, I'll, I'll, I'll put it out there that I'm not an, an eye mobility specialist. I think there's a lot of other people around from some, there's some really amazing people who've done a lot of work in this region. I mean, eye mobility for us is we're relatively new to this area. Um, water draining effect. I mean, I, I assume that this is talking to the fact that molecules will be dragging and interacting with water. So I can say that, you know, we have played with a lot of, we have fiddled with um, trying doping gases within the tin cell as well. Um, and we do see quite a drastic effect so that I think there is, you know, when, for instance, if you dope in, <clears throat> excuse me, if you dope in acetonitrile into the gas flow, <clears throat> you you can change the, the you know, the apparent cross-sectional areas quite easily. So, um, yes, I, I think there is definitely, uh, I'm not sure about the draining effect, but um, there is there is definitely effects with within the, the the components of the gas flow there and this is definitely something you can control so within the tim cell you you're exclusively so we use obviously we're using the cat disc spray at the front which is pushing in nitrogen and then within the tim cell itself it's pushing in nitrogen as well so i will say that the across the you know the retention time and across long periods of time as long as you're maintaining a consistent nitrogen purity and gas pressure the quality of the gas and the gas flow is is very highly regulated and controlled. Excellent. Thanks, Angie. And our next question asks, um, how do the uh, current software deal with all iron acquisition mode uh, on IMS data? Um, is that something you can help answer? Thanks, Kiara. Um, I actually know Kiara. <laughs> She's a, a very good friend of a friend of mine. <laughs> um, the software at the moment doesn't really exist for all line acquisition mode. So we've been predominantly using our own algorithms and extraction techniques. Um, it's, this is something I'm, I know it's, uh, it's on the horizon. Um, I think there's a few other groups that I know of a few other groups that are working on this as well. Um, it's not my position to say, you know, where they're at and when that's likely to be available, but I would say, you know, in the near future, you know, there will be something to 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 read in and sink people's teeth into. But I, I would say that this is it's probably going to be a longer term endeavour. The uh, I would obviously with a lot of these all line approaches, and I think this is sort of you know people struggled this with for, for years. You know, early in the days of DIA with with Swath and you know Sykes' approach to this, that the the data sizes are actually pretty substantial. So being able to cope and and manage these data sizes is, is data sizes is actually quite challenging. Um, and that's probably for me. That's that's definitely been out the biggest. You know, we have a, you know, only sort of one person in the lab that's really devoted to sort of writing a lot of these sorts of algorithms. And it's it's a very very complex process. Um, there's working with these big data sets. You're having to work with with cluster compute. So these this is not a there's not a simple solution to these. But I think there are a lot of smart people out there that are working on this that will come up with some pretty amazing solutions. Excellent. Thanks, Andrew. And our next question, uh, I suppose, is kind of related um, sort of onto that, is um, what would you wish for in the next generation uh, of the technology? Yeah, um, I, I think, you know, for me, seeing a smaller format of this this instrument, um, I think there's, there's probably an opportunity to, with the resolution of the TIMS, I mean, something I didn't talk about too much in my talk, was the resolution of the TIMS, and I think it's 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 a pretty astonishing instrument given that you know within a region of about ten to twenty centimeters, you can get upwards of you know over a hundred to sometimes closer to two hundred resolution on these these molecules within um, the iron mobility separation. That I think that we could take advantage of that and actually reduce almost the resolution on the top. So I can imagine you know my dream instrument would be to have a, a smaller format instrument that we could potentially be a, a benchtop instrument that could be sold cheaper and used much more broadly. And I could certainly see something like that um, being much more attractive in the, in the clinical setting. Excellent. Thanks, Andrew. Well, I'm afraid that is all we have time for today. I would now like to thank Dr. Andrew Webb for his presentation and for answering your questions. I would also like to thank the webcast sponsors, Brooker, and of course, you, the audience, for taking the time to be with us today. Remember, you can watch this webcast again at any time on demand at nature.com webcasts. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join us again soon.